station. You just have to adjust. All right, all right, all right. Monday night, 8 o'clock, you are where you need to be with Detect America. Welcome to the show. I'm Steve Pacifico, and you're not. Over here, my main man, Frank Loper, Gola in the house, rocking it. And, and right down here in the corner there, Ron DeGhetto, the gold digger himself. Welcome, folks. Welcome. We have a great show lined up for you. I am so psyched to have this guest on tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce him as Mr. Martin Bailey. Okay. Sometimes, um, sometimes they refer to me as Captain Martin Bailey. Captain Martin Bailey. That's you know how I'm calling. I'm just calling you Captain. This way I don't have to remember your name. You know what? I, exactly. I do. <laughs> exactly. Um, hooked. Hooked. I remember months ago flipping through the shows and I come across a show, Billion Dollar Wreck. I'm like, well, what's this? I start this thing and immediately I was like hooked. And I'm like, man, this is a great show. Um, and I immediately said, man, I'd like to get Mr. Uh, Captain Barely on our show. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, this guy would be great on the show. So I want him to tell, tell us everything about himself and his show before I really get into it. But hopefully some of you guys checked it out before this week and brushed up on it and may have already been hooked. So without further ado, Captain Barely, thank you for being here tonight. How are you this evening? Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, Steve. Ron and Frank, uh, you know this is uh, this is quite an honor actually to be invited on your show. Thank there we you. go, everyone's smiling now. <laughs> hey, well, you made us feel good. We we make up the group Detect America, which primarily we are a metal detecting based community. We all metal detect. We all love to find goodies. We metal detect in fields. We metal detect on the beach. However. I've, you know, metal detecting is not a hobby in itself. It's, it's a hobby that includes a lot of other interests. And we have found out through, through the years that our members and me and Frank and Ron love salvaging stories, love gold stories, finding the treasures. And yours is one of the best. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us about your background? Well, my name is Martin Barely, Captain Martin Barely. Uh, although I'm no longer active Captain, but I still did earn the the uh, the moniker, if you will. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I uh, started uh, three dive shops in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, the first one I was an undergraduate at Brooklyn College. I started teaching uh, scuba diving as an undergrad in the experimental college program. I then was an adjunct lecturer in the adult education department while still an undergrad. And the programs that I would teach in scuba diving were so successful that Brooklyn College decided to matriculate the course. I said, wow, this is going to be nice. I'll have a nice job teaching scuba diving. But when they looked at me for the job as instructor for the course, I said, well, you haven't gotten your degree yet. And there was some internal politics and someone who had never really dived at all. They hired as their instructor. They got him as instructor credentials eventually. And I felt kind of cheated since I started the enthusiasm and got the ball rolling there. Uh, so what I decided to do is I said, wait a minute, I can still make money at this. I'm going to open my dive shop right around the corner. Uh, I'll have a steady influx of customers. And that's how, that's how I got started uh, with my dive shop. Dive shop was ultimately quite successful. I ended up buying the building. Uh, buying a boat. I was in my 20s. Uh, so what a great job. What a great life experience for a guy in his 20s running his own dive shop, teaching classes, running out on the boat. You know, we're making six, six, trips, a, six trips a week, two or three nights a week for classes. And uh, eventually had my girlfriend move in with me in my upstairs apartment. So I'd get roll out of bed, run downstairs, open the gate. And there I was in the dive shop. Of course, and your, your dive shop was this where? This was on Avenue I and Nostrand Avenue called Brooklyn Divers. So you were doing dives in Brooklyn? Yeah, Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn boy. Wow. Yeah, and you got all, no, all, got the you. all the people from the class were coming into your dive shop anyway because you were around the corner. That's exactly why I opened there. <laughs> right. I didn't want to lose the business. Yeah. And I said, shit, they're cutting me out of the job. So I said, I said, 
Can I say fuck them on on this? Uh, well, <laughs> no, but okay. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Hey, I'm a sailor. I'm a sailor. I could hey, use listen, I could use different raunchy than me. language. That's so, right. so basically, that's what I did. I opened the shop, and um, and the shop was quite successful. In fact, I opened up a second shop called Divers Equipment Warehouse which was uh, in the Queens College. My first one's Brooklyn College. The other one's Queens College. And I opened up Divers Equipment Warehouse as a mail order house. Uh, basically, this was in 1977, roughly, 1978. I opened my second shop in Queens to use it as a mail order house, Divers Equipment Warehouse. And the reason why I did that, in uh, 1976 or so, uh, Congress before that had legislated what they call fair trade laws. Fair trade laws allowed manufacturers in certain states to sell all their items at retail price. And the idea was that the idea was if it was a fair trade state, the small mom and pop store was selling at the same price as the mega store. So it it was designed to keep the mom and top pop business in place. But by 1976 or so, they said, wait a minute. This isn't capitalism. Capitalism, let the strong survive, let them compete on the market. The consumer ultimately benefits. And so they outlawed fair trade laws. Now, in the diving industry, the diving manufacturers were quite happy about that situation because a little history on the diving, a little history on diving, general diving. When diving started out in the 50s, uh, sport diving, in order to, to learn how to dive, you would buy your equipment through a mail order house. You'd get a little brochure. This is how to scuba dive. Never hold your breath. And you take your equipment, your new equipment, down to the beach, and you were you were diving. No such thing as professional dive shops. No such thing as certifying agencies. And early on, YMCA got involved in, uh, in teaching people how to dive and issuing certificates. And, of course, from there, you had other organizations, Professional Association of Diving Instructors, National Association of Scuba Diving Instructors, uh, National Association of Underwater Instructors, uh, there's several several instructor organizations forming. And, of course, once they started that, they said, well, let's, as a diving instructor, let's open up our dive shops. So now people had a way of selling, uh, getting certified, and a source for their equipment. And, of course, the mail water houses that started the diving industry – you know, they were still holding, everyone was holding the retail price. So the mail order houses were servicing uh, areas because of fair trade laws, were servicing uh, areas where there were no dive shops. So people can still buy their diving equipment mail order. But the dive shops were now selling the equipment. Of course, they were the ones generating the customers. So uh, that was great for the manufacturers. They had people actually generating courses and generating customers to sell their equipment. And that made the, that made the dive industry grow. So in 1978, here I am with my little dive shop, and I said, wait a minute, there's an opportunity here. I can now discount all my diving equipment, uh, and I could, since everyone else was still holding the price, even though fair trade laws were out, outlawed, but I knew the change in the law. I said, I can now discount the price. I opened up Divers Equipment Warehouse to, to start a discount house on diving equipment, and, and I, in a sense, I knew what was going to happen. Uh, the diving manufacturers got together at a six-hour meeting in California. They pulled my ads out of Skin Diver magazine because they wanted the dive shops to survive, and I was cutting into the dive shops business. So they essentially tried to put me out of business. So at the time, I filed a $5 million antitrust and price-fixing conspiracy against the diving industry. Uh, I'm still the young kid. I, I'm sitting at my table with my one my one lawyer, and the uh, defendant's table, they had like eight eight or ten lawyers with their clients sitting at the other table. We went to trial. The jury came in. And here I am with my little lawyer and my young guy. And I was getting winks and nods from the jury. And all of a sudden, they all started to crumble and settle. So uh, that got me that got me about $280,000 at the time. This is 1978 or so. Uh, which was about, I guess, about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars today. Not a, not a bad piece of change. <laughs> of I was allowed to reopen my dive shops, and I said, "Well, well, wait a minute. I'm still a young guy. Uh, what can I do? What can I do with my two hundred eighty thousand dollars? I can reopen my dive shops. Of course, I can get back into the mail water business. <laughs> uh, we, we beat the the diving equipment manufacturers, and I said, "Well, the problem with opening a dive shop in New York." is what do you do in the winter? Where do people go diving in the winter? So I said, well, let me look at a diving resort down in the Caribbean. So I, I flew down, found a diving a resort for sale. It was going to turn it into a diving resort called uh, Golden Rock 
diving resort on a little island called St. Eustatius, otherwise known as Station in the French West Indies. And it was a beautiful place, a beautiful black sand on a volcanic island. The problem with the resort was on the Atlantic side. And the Atlantic side in the Caribbean was always rough, so it wasn't conducive to a dive resort. If it had been on the on the Caribbean side, I'd probably be running a Caribbean resort and Republic would still be out there, people talking about it. My other choice, of course, since I ran dive boats and I ran dive charters, uh, I decided to uh, say, well, what else can I do? There was this big wreck out there. Everyone knew about it, Republic. It was a treasure wreck, uh, written about treasure books since, uh, since the ship sank. Uh, a lot of the treasure books, uh, Fell's Guide, or Ricebergs, uh, treasure book. They all mention Republic, and they talk about Republic's $3 million in eagles, but they don't say anything about where those eagles were going or who owned them or anything like that. But I happened to have the money. The, the Caribbean resort wasn't optimum, so I said, all right, I'm going to go look for this dive resort. Excuse me, look for this shipwreck. I knew it would be out near the Andrea Doria someplace. Uh, I had the cash, so I uh, closed up my shops in New York. I figured I'd add, I put three to five years into the project enough time as a young guy to, to do the project. If it failed, I'd have a, I have the rest of my life to bounce back. Uh, so I moved to Martha's Vineyard, bought a nice little house on the vineyard, opened my scuba diving shop, Martha's Vineyard Scuba Headquarters, right opposite the Black Dog Restaurant. Uh, interesting clients. I had JFK Jr. at the time uh, was one of my clients. Uh, Jackie O came into the shop, wants to buy a set of fins. Unfortunately, I didn't have her size. Uh, and I met my landlord at the time. This is an interesting backstory. My landlord at the time was a fellow by the name of Barry Clifford. And for you treasure hunter, hunters out there, Barry Clifford was a fellow who ultimately uh, reportedly found the Witta, the pirate ship Witta off Cape Cod. Wow. Uh, in fact, he runs a little museum out there. So now remember, I moved to Martha's Vineyard specifically to lo locate and find Republic. He came into my dive and I rented my dive dive shop from Barry Clifford. He happened to own the building with a, a dentist by the name of Michael Jampel. Uh, so Barry asked me, he said, hey, Marty, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out because he figured opening up a dive, sh a dive shop in a seasonal resort is not a moneymaker. You know, you, you, particularly, uh, you know, New York City, I have, uh, you know, six million people. You know, Martha's Vineyard, I think there were, you know, 10,000 full-time residents. So once I exhaust the initial supply of fire, fire uh, firemen, you know, policemen, the type A personality who take uh, scuba lessons, I'd run, I'd, I'd exhaust my population of students. But my purpose wasn't to teach diving, it wasn't to run a dive shop for a profit. My idea was to set up a diving operation merely as a base of operations to go out and search for a republic. So I knew all the dive boats that ran the Doria. I hired a boat called the Wahoo, uh, Captain Captain Belinda, uh, who's who I knew for for the entire time, basically, once I opened my dive shop. In fact, his son, Lance, worked for me uh, in my, my second dive shop in Brooklyn Aqua Ventures, which was on Flatbush <laughs> Avenue, uh, down from King's Plaza. Uh, and I hired his boat, because I know he dove the dove the dory and ran charters to the dory. The dory is about six miles away from the Republic. Oh, dory is uh, oh, northwest. Really? Yeah, very close. Oh, in fact, wow. they both, both sank under remarkably similar circumstances. Right. So I hired his boat and we went out after two and a half days of search. There's a backstory to this, but I won't get into it unless someone wants to know it. Uh, we went out two and a half days. We found a big wreck. Uh, it was, it was first, we, the first site we went to was the official position where the government said the, the Republic sank. It's where the British hydrographic office said the Republic sank is where the U S government plotted uh, the Republic, uh, there was a PD position doubtful on the chart, but there was a rec symbol there. So I said, well, we're going to go to where the official position was. Of course, we scanned that area. Side scan was then a new item that was recently re released to public access. Right. We went out and uh, and find uh, found a, found nothing at the official location. So I said, all right, let's go to let's go look up our backup plan. Our backup plan. We had the reported positions of two Coast Guard boats that reported where the Republic sank. One says it sank roughly here on a 40 fathom line. The other one says it sank here on a 40 fathom line. The distance between the two, oop, where is my camera? Distance between the two is about six miles. So we started at position A, uh, did a uh, across a, a uh, mowing the lawn across the 40 fathom line. Both agreed at the depth. So we, we found this big, big object exactly midway between the two reported Coast Guard positions. 
There's nothing on the chart there. There's no rec symbol there. There's no PD there. One of the sources I looked for uh, to find the record part of the research was the what they call the anti-submarine warfare charts of World War One and World War Two. Research is always key, and I'm sure your your listeners understand that too. You want you want to research right. where where you're where you're going to find something, uh, and of course a shipwreck. You know, one of the sources we looked at was the ASW or anti-submarine warfare charts of World War One and World War Two. Basically, it was na items collected by the Navy to be used in anti-submarine warfare and virtually, and wreck divers along the East Coast know this, virtually all wrecks along the, the coast of the United States, the East Coast in particular, were wire-dragged and depth-charged so that they could be leveled so that enemy U-boats could not evade sonar detection. The Republic, which is incidentally directly in the center of the outbound shipping traffic lane, not on any chart until I found her in 1980. After that, there was no reason to conceal her, her position anymore because we filed on her. Uh, there's nothing there. It's not on the anti-submarine warfare charts, too. So for a wreck this size to have gone unnoticed in World War II, there are two reasons for that. Either it went unnoticed for two world wars right in the center of the outbound shipping traffic lane or... It was a classified wreck and therefore redacted from the charts that have filtered down to public access. I right, mean, a wreck so of you, size, 600 feet long, coming up 60 feet off the bottom, could not have been undetected by the U.S. Navy for two world wars. So what I'm um, understanding by watching the show and hearing you, you, you located the wreck and then immediately filed on it because um, – <clears throat> I remember in your show, other people tried, and, and just briefly go into it. I know they, they tried to steal the, the rights to it from you, and well, you we, won. We, did, we didn't immediately file on it uh, because, well, and, uh, let me did. explain. This is, this is the backstory that I said I can get into if someone raises the issue. And since you, since you have, Steve, <laughs> since you have, the, uh, we, we made the dive in 1981. Uh, we had three, four sets of divers. We had the captain, uh, the captain's crew, who always set the hook. They're the first ones down on the wreck. That was Janet, Janet uh, Beesner, I believe that's the pronunciation. Beesner, Beesner, and uh, and I think it was Frank uh, uh, Hanks, uh, Hank, 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 oh, Hank, Hank. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, Hank. Well, in any event. Uh, they and given the timing of the dives, we we were diving compressed air, twin eighties in a pony bottle with two hundred and forty feet of water, and that's that's an absolute no no. I mean that was that was high risk. Uh, you get narcosis for every fifty feet of descent. Uh, so by the time you reach two forty, two twenty, starts at two twenty, drops down to two seventy in the washout. But by right. the time you get down to that depth, you're having the equivalent. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, four four dry martinis on an empty stomach is the equivalent equivalent uh, alcoholic comparison. So I was this was the first time I made that dive to that depth. You know, I made uh, considering I was a master instructor, ran my own dive shop and dive show. I made hundreds of dives, I taught twelve hundred people how to scuba dive out of Brooklyn divers alone. Uh, but I was in the second crew. No, I was in the third crew. By the time the first crew come up, I was already in the water. My, my second crew didn't make it down to the bottom. Me and my buddy made it down. And what you're looking at as a, as, as a diver at that depth is equivalent to looking at the side of an elephant in a dark room and trying to figure out what it is. One of the things that threw us off is that when we found it, it was glass flat and she was leaking oil, plumes of oil running up to the surface, sort of as if she was saying, you know, beckoning, come find me. Uh, but that also threw us off because we know Republic was a steam fired vessel, uh, and therefore her, her fuel was coal, not oil. So, and there are a lot of wrecks out there, vintage world war one, world war two. So we were thinking tank or freighter, uh, and I was prevented from making a positive ID. I found out years later that the first team had actually made a positive ID, uh, that Janet had actually uh, taken a photo of the bow. And when we came up, Steve uh, cut the charter short. I had another day of charter. I had more tanks to make a following uh, days of diving. And Steve, no doubt, told by Janet what they had found. They had found. It was my charter, you know, and everyone was working for me. Uh, they didn't tell me that we had found Republic. Steve told me I have to cut the charter short. I have another charter on Friday. So we pulled the hook, and I didn't know what we had found. Steve had known, but he didn't bother to tell me. In fact, there was a bottle of champagne on his boat that we were going to open once we found the wreck, and, and I didn't know what we had found, and Steve kept that information from me. 
Uh, I came back uh, to dock, got all my equipment off his boat. Thanks, Steve, very much. And, and since I knew he had breached our charter, I said I'd stop payment on my check and sued him uh, subsequently for, for breach of contract. We settled that suit ultimately. Uh, but uh, that's how that went down. Uh, in 1983, uh, this was in 1981. In, in uh, 1982 or 80, early 83, Barry Clifford had come into my dive shop. He knew I was looking for the wreck. We'd already made the charter. And Barry told me, he said, Barry, he said, Marty, everyone knows where the Republic is. And then he read me off my Loran coordinates. And Barry had already filed on his widow. And Loran coordinates that he read me off were the ones that I created out of thin air as our search starting area. So I knew that Barry didn't pull those. He had to have pulled those rec those numbers right off my chart. And I said, Barry, if Barry's particularly interested in my location, I better do something. So what I did is I pulled his paperwork for his original widow filing in federal court. Had my because I'm filing in my corporate name. I needed a lawyer. I called my uh, real estate lawyer on Martha's Vineyard, uh, Alan Alan Fine Alan Fine Finer Alan Finer. Uh, and said, Alan, would you, would you, yeah, here's the draft complaint. We filed an unidentified wrecked and abandoned vessel. We didn't know whether, whether it was Republic or not. And that was our first filing in 19, 1983, right? We filed, found it in 81. We uh, made the positive ID actually in 82, filed on 83. The positive ID was made in 82 when I had a fellow who was on my original trip, Kent Guernsey. He ended up getting a job with a, a diving company down in the Gulf called uh, uh, International Under, uh, Underwater Completion Team, UCT, uh, ran by a uh, well-known fellow, uh, uh, Dar Cuz Darty, uh, Cuz from a real Cajun down of down out of Louisiana. In fact, <laughs> one of his famous sayings was, "Boy, if you're waiting on me, you're backing up." <laughs> he, he was he was an interest very interesting colorful character but he cut my fellow one one of my support divers kent guernsey started working for him this was also a depression in the offshore oil industry at the time so all these diving companies were going out of business and he was looking for a hail mary pass so uh kent told him about the republic he called me up you know and i said yes you know you want to go up bring your boat up and we'll do another dive on the wreck we found to see what it was and if it wasn't republic we'll go search for republic so he made he came up he made a bandit dive without me. Fortunately, Kent was more loyal to me than he was to Cuz. Told me about it, uh, and uh, also that Cuz had rec rec recovered White Star Line plates. Well, the only White Star liner in the area was the Republic or the Atlantic. The Atlantic's up <laughs> off Nova Scotia. So I'd known that we had found the Republic. So I met him in a diner. I said, Cuz, we have to talk this out, you know, before I sue you. Or maybe I did sue him. Uh, but in any event, we met at a diner in uh, Fairport, and I had a friend of mine who was my, quote, bodyguard at the time, a friend. He wanted to get his uh, license to carry, so he got a license for, for uh, a 357 Magnum. So we're sitting at the at the diner with a comfortable position, and my friend opens up his jacket and just lets the, you know, the 357 Magnum be seen. And I said, cuz, you know, you want you don't want to do this. <laughs> so... So in any event, Cuz Cuz ended up giving me all my all my uh, artifacts he had recovered. We made a positive ID, and we subsequently changed the, the our our uh, our action on uh, instead of an unidentified wrecked and abandoned vessel. Uh, our action was against the RMS Republic. Yeah, it's amazing how people try and undercut. I mean, well, you know, I can understand that, but you know, I, I know that you did prevail, and they they gave you the salvage rights. But <clears throat> here's the. Oil? What were the oil plumes from, Martin? Were they? Well, they, they you're gonna any ship, particularly a steamship, is gonna have uh, bunker oil for lubrication for, for the pistons and stuff, right? Yeah, for the pistons and all the other machinery, and it just happened to be that that year the uh, the bunkers apparently had just broken loose and seeped up, which you know, but it threw us off too. But that's the point, yeah. you know. This yeah. is, you know, we're thinking we're thinking a, a fuel fired vessel, you know, uh, not not coal fired, right? Uh, and we okay. were I was not, not able to make the positive ID. So, yeah, through it, through a circuitous route, uh, you know, I ended up filing because of Barry's inquisitiveness. I ended up filing on the Republic because another person attempted to uh, do a bandit dive. 
Uh, and yes, and other people came out of the woodwork once we identified the wreck. Then we had other people filing in the in the District of Massachusetts after we had filed. Let's try, huh? Uh, say, saying uh, one fellow, uh, Jim James Amplis from Northern Ocean Services, got one of the big uh, mucky muck lawyers in Admiralty, Dave Haran, who was a lawyer for uh, the Atocha people, Mel Fisher's people. He represented James Amplis and tried to intervene, saying, "Oh, we were preparing for this and we we're doing that." Uh, you know, and, and well, you were, you were preparing, we did it. So yeah, he, he, he was, he was not, yeah. yeah, my, uh, my lawyer, a fellow by the name of Dean Sycon was relatively well new to Admiralty law at the time. And, uh, Dean said, well, they want to make a deal. They want to make a deal. So I said, I said, fuck them. <laughs> and my lawyer was quite upset because here he's going against one of the main Admiralty lawyers in the world. Right, you know, against my little lord, but I. This is something I, I'm always used to. It's a, between me taking on the diving industry and my little dive shop, uh, and now taking on Dave Haran uh, and his attempt to interlope. We also had uh, Parry Bar, which is the largest bank in the world, filed a uh, an appearance, and eventually we had the U.S. government filing, saying they own all all the gold on Republic. Well, well here's, here's, here's with the them for a decade. Have, there's there's a reason the for that, for you, Captain. huh? <laughs> Here's the question I had. Just a, just a little bit that I that I look when I'm looking up the Republic and all. Um, so I, I see that was the gold known to be there, and if that was the case, why wasn't it on anybody's manifest? Were they, were they was it something that you knew was there, or something you stumbled across in your research? All right. I did I did things backwards because I happen to be I happen to have a decent amount of money. Uh, and the dive resort didn't pay off, you know, so I said, what am I going to do with my money? I'll go out and look for this wreck. So normally the way things are done is you do the research first, then you go out and look for the wreck. Uh, but I did things backwards. I, I went out and said, well, this wreck was rumored to have ex had this vast cargo. One treasure book from 1934 puts it at riches beyond most men's wildest dreams. Uh, and they always reference $3 million in eagles, $3 million in eagles, all the original references, but not a single book said, whose money was it? Why was it on Republic? So it was more in terms of the rumor was, it was more in terms of a rumor circulating for $3 million. My wife. I, oh, I'm being upstaged. No, oh, that's that's her, that's her again. Little little children and pets always upstage upstage you. That's right. Yeah. My dog's next. I hear him up there barking. I'm about to go yell at him in a minute. So okay. go ahead. Tell us more about this gold, because. Okay, so so I went out and found the wreck, and I said, "All right, what do I do now? I can't sell it on a rumor." So I really had to dig, and it required a lot of digging because there was nothing in any of the treasure books other than $3 million in eagles. That was it. That was it. No, why it was on a Republic. No, who owned it. None of that information. So the first thing I had to do was understand what was happening politically at the time, what was happening financially at the time. So I became an expert on the New York financial market uh, for 1909 and eventually from 1904 through 1914. And you have to understand, you have to understand a foreign exchange, what was happening at the time of foreign exchange and, and what was happening in politics. And digging through all that information, one of the things that perked my interest was uh, the 1909 loan. It was a loan that Russia floated in Paris primarily. Uh, it happened to close coincidentally January 22nd, 1909, uh, which was the very day the Republic sailed. So the first thing that you think of says, well, it, it can't be Russian gold because the loan closed January 22nd. Russia got $240 million. And I think if most researchers look at that on its face, that's the conclusion they would have, no Russian gold. But I, I went one step further. I said, well, let's look at the details of the Russian, Russian loan. And what I did is I made a trip to Paris. We went into the archives of the French banks. Many of the French banks were nationalized. They're originally private banks that were nationalized by the Republic of France at some point in their career. So their early records became public records. And I looked at the 1909 loan specifically, and I actually found the syndicate loan documents between the French banks and the Russian government. 
And when you look at those documents, you recognize how Russia was paid when the loan closed. When the loan closed January 22nd, 1909, Russia got credit for that money. Uh, basically, the 1909 loan, this gets into some of the history. The 1909 loan was, was, was promoted by the French banks so that Russia would have enough money to pay off its 1904 world bond. It raised money in 1904 to fight the, to fight the Japanese. That was only a five-year loan. That was $150 million. That money was coming due in May of 1909. So uh, when you look at the actual documents, how was Russia getting paid? Well, out of that $240 million of 1909 new money, $90 million was to be applied to Russia's 1909 budget, and the balance, $150 million of it, was segmented to pay off the 1904 loan coming due in May of 1909. So out of the $90 million, Russia was getting new money for its 1909 budget. Now, this is, this is the end of January already. But furthermore, Russia, although it became Russian money at the time, $150 segmented to pay off the 1904 loan coming due in, in May of 1909, uh, the $90 million, Russia was to be paid over a period of six months. The first payment of that money was to begin, it was basically 20% of the $90 million in 30 days, another 20% in 30 days, and 15, 15, 15, 15, each succeeding month. So Russia was to get 20% 20, 20 of $90 million or $18 million February 22nd, 1909. So what we did is we isolated a 30-day loan, $3 million dollars, was below market rate. It was at a it was at a one and a quarter, you know, should be one and a half percent interest rate for 30 days. We isolate and it was for three million dollars. Bingo. That's the short term loan money, the three million dollar short term loan. If you need money today for anyone and you and you have money coming to you in the future, what do you do? You borrow against the money coming to you in the future. And that's exactly where the three million dollars comes in. Uh, and we we isolated that transaction. That explains why Russia borrowed three million dollars because they didn't get any money the day the loan closed. They only got money thirty days later and then paid off. And we tracked that transaction down, uh, and we found also that Russia's the Russia that out of the state loan money that was to be paid to Russia by the French banks, uh, three million dollars of which was repaid to the Russian state bank and. Uh, in uh, February 22nd. So there's a repayment of that $3 million loan. Even though the money was lost in the Republic, you still have to pay for the loan that you took out 30 days earlier. It's not their problem. The, the okay. Whole so now, wait, wait. This, now we get into something really interesting. That's what you'll find in my book, The Czar's Treasure. I'll get a plug in, plug, plug. The Czar's Treasure available on Amazon. Uh, that's also the amount of money that we talked about on Billion Dollar Rec. Now we get to the really interesting part, the new research. Think logically now. You have money coming to you in the future, but you need money today, so you borrow against that. But what is Russia going to do logically, or what, is, what would anyone do if you needed money today? All right, what you do is you use your own money first, your own money. So whatever surplus funds Russia had in New York at the time, they would take. No sense borrowing money if you have your own money to use. The second thing they're going to do is they're going to sell their 1909 bonds in New York. Because they're selling their 1909 bonds in Paris, they're selling them in London, they're selling them in Berlin, they're selling them in every major financial capital around the world. They're certainly going to be selling them in New York. And lo and behold, what we find is that there's a that the government, the U.S. government, is is putting together 25 million dollars in coin. Uh, so this is what you do: you you bought, take your own money first, you then sell your bonds. And then you uh, borrow whatever surplus you need. And we found an interesting newspaper article that said uh, the sale, what was going to affect the New York money market rate uh, in New York. And it said uh, the sale of new Russian bonds at a discount. Russia is selling bonds in New York. And how much are the bonds? Enough bonds to affect the money market rate in New York. Uh, make money harder to get. And of course, what happens is the government puts out a cover story as to why it is assembling $25 million uh, because it's making money harder to come by in New York. And the cover story at the time was uh, they're assembling money in support of tax inauguration uh, because the Treasury Department wants it on hand. It makes it's a, it's a bogus cover story. Uh, this is this is the same type of cover story that we found in September of 1905. 
uh, when uh, $22 million of Japanese gold left New York to Paris. It arrived in Paris. Uh, there was no corresponding U.S. export report. There is a corresponding French import report of this $22 million in gold coin coming from the U.S. It shows up clearly in printed uh, French import data. It also shows up in the Bank of France data. And this was a secret shipment. Why was it secret in 1905? Well, in 1905, Roosevelt settles the 1904-1904 uh, Japanese-Russian War. He becomes, uh, he earns a Nobel Peace Prize for settling that war. And part of the Sub Rosa Agreement is that Japan shipped $22 million to Russia uh, as compensation for the, for the assets that Japan had seized during the war. This was a, this was a secret payment. Uh, not even the, the, uh, the experts on the Russo-Japanese War uh, are familiar with this. I identified it. It shows up. I did an import-export study between 1904 and 1914. A $22 million shipment of New York uh, gold, gold coming from New York, arrives in Paris. And they put out a cover story. This is an important part. This is the connection. They put out a cover story in 1905 uh, explaining why the banks were recalling all their short-term loans, why the price of market price of money was going up. And they said uh, the bankers or the bankers or the U.S. government is assembling this gold to send money to the interior for crop payments. This is September. The the uh, oh, it's a harvest moon tonight. Yes, that's an interesting. Yes. <laughs> there's, 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 that's a propitious connection. Uh, harvest moon. They said the money was being assembled uh, not for export. It's not leaving the country. Don't worry about it. It's merely going to the interior for crop payments. Well, that cover story worked well for the secret shipment that we clearly identified that left New York. <coughs> 1909, we have a similar cover story to explain why the banks were recalling $25 million uh, in gold. The similar cover story was uh, that they were assembling gold in preparation for Taft's inauguration, which makes no sense whatsoever. They couldn't use the crop payment cover story. This is a member. This is the Roosevelt administration, the same people that put out the cover story in, in September of 1905. Uh, they put out the same, a different cover story because they couldn't use a crop story in January. So what was happening? The Taft inauguration was coming in in March. So they said the Treasury Department was assembling this for for uh, in preparation for Taft's inauguration, which makes no sense. It makes no difference where the government keeps its gold. You know, and most of the government gold was kept in New York anyway. So that's that's so we've now increased from from the three million dollar short term loan again. You would only borrow money when you're short when you reach a shortfall. The shortfall was. Uh, the 20, 22 million, $25 million in Russian bonds sold for $22 million, borrowed the $3 million shortfall. So the amount on Republic is $25 million. One newspaper, one New York newspaper got it right. Uh, they said the government was assembling money for export, no doubt. And we have the research on this. This is research beyond my book, beyond Billion Dollar Rec. Of course, if I, if I had known the research at the time, I would have talked about it. But we just came into this independently in 2017. One important point, we, we also have, and this is a fascinating connection, we also have a witness, an actual witness on the $25 million figure. Uh, one of the people that I met uh, over the years was a uh, doctor, uh, Jack Binz's granddaughter, Jack Binz's, who is wireless operator on the Republic, his granddaughter, uh, who was who was uh, 16 at the time when Jack Benz was still alive? Jack Benz, the wireless operator, would have known about this. So in 2009, there's a hundredth anniversary of the sinking of the Republic. Republic was was a historic event because it was the first use for wireless for distress at sea. Jack Benz was the wireless operator, uh, so he became quite famous at the time. So the hundredth anniversary, they have a little get together for all the radio operators ham radio operators who want to celebrate the first use of wireless for the presence. This is 2009. And in 2009, uh, I heard her presentation soon thereafter. Uh, and she mentions the, the uh, financial market conditions in 1907, that there was a panic and run on the banks. In 1908, there was a worldwide depression. And in 1909, she says Russia needed to pay off its debt. Uh, and the disclosure of $25 million dollars would have caused the panic on Wall Street. And of course, when I heard that in 2009, I discounted it. I'm the expert, 25 million. I said, shit, if she had said $3 million, I could use it. But I couldn't use it in 2009 because I had nothing to support 25 million. 
So I meet her again in 2015 when we're filming Billion Dollar Wreck at the uh, Fall River Maritime Museum. And actually I asked her, I said, did Binzi, her affectionate name for her grandfather, did Binzi ever, ever talk about the cargo? And she told me, no, he never mentioned it. And of course, when I spoke to her, I had completely forgotten about our 2009 presentation. So I, I let it, I let it, I let it uh, pass. Uh, I wrote my book in 2013. We had the, the 2015 a Billion Dollar Wreck. Uh, 25 million is never mentioned anywhere. And then I re-listened to her, her, her presentation. 2017 is when we developed the $25 million independently. And then I re-listened to her presentation. And there it is, $25 million. We have a newspaper account to back it up. Uh, that uh, that uh, the, the government is assembling $25 million in gold. The cover story comparable to our 2005 cover story. We have a witness testimony from someone who isn't a no, the granddaughter of the wireless operator of the public. $25 million is now the magic number. Uh, and that's why you have all the secrecy. A $3 million loss is a billion dollars. Right. Do the okay. extrapolation. $25 million is $7 billion very conservatively. All right, Cap, let me... Uh... Let me just, I got a lot of questions for you that I want to try and fit in. And there's a lot of, uh, some things I want to ask you. Uh, the first question I, I do want to get, get right off the bat is, we know you believe that gold is there. Oh, I don't believe it's there. We've proven the Navy cargo. The okay. Navy cargo is, the two cargoes. The Navy cargo is $800,000 face value. That's been appraised at 150 to $340 million. We have proven that cargo. That's why the U.S. government sued it. The U.S. government said, right. when they sued us, they said they owned all the gold. And the I reason why they own the Russian gold, we have, and we finally figured this out too, the reason why they said they own all the gold, the reason why they own the Russian gold is that when the Bolsheviks seized power in, in, in 1917, and we had the Russian Revolution between 1917 and 1922, we froze all the czarist assets in the U.S. Those assets remained frozen until 1933 when the U.S. government recognized the Soviet Union. And what did the U.S. government do? When it unfroze the assets, it paid itself off first. It paid off, it paid off U.S. citizens and U.S. banks for the bonds that they had purchased in New York. So the U.S. government had a subrogated interest in those bonds when they paid themselves from seized czarist assets uh, the government had already been paid, so therefore they could not double dip into the republic's gold. Right. That's why they didn't. Appeal. That's why they didn't appeal. I understand it. Uh, the U.S. Navy cargo, we've proven that. We have the payment from the Treasury Department uh, to White Star Line for an eight hundred thousand dollar face value shipment, in addition to the food provisions on Republic. Okay. So, that's why but, the government sued us, and that's why they said not only did they own the Navy cargo, which I knew they always owned. But they, they owned all the cargo. And I never understood why they would claim to own the Russian cargo when my original research said Navy cargo and Russian cargo. Now we know why they claimed all the gold, because they would have had a subrogated interest. Now we know why they didn't appeal, because uh, they had paid themselves off from sea star assets in 1933. This is okay. this is a financial sleuthing, sleuthing uh, examination. Okay. I, incidentally, so, I have an MBA, so I know a little bit about something. I understand it. About business. Okay. So... I, I'm under the impression, or I believe, that the boat had previously been salvaged before you got to it. Is that is that true? And do you still believe that they, the gold may have not been salvaged prior to you getting no, to the it, ship? All right. The, when I found the wreck in, in 1981, and we have a side scan of this, the wreck was pristine. The main deck house was in place. Uh, there were no signs of any salvage. We did a, in 1987, we spent 60, 72 days on site with saturation divers. We worked that wreck from bow to stern, and there were no indications of prior salvage. It was a prior salvage in 1986. One of my competitors came into court, Marshallton Inc., uh, told the court, Your Honor, we could do this in 30 days. And we told the court, Your Honor, they can't do it in 30 days. And of course, right. uh, uh, our, our judge at the time, Walter J. Skinner, who was a judge in the civil action, uh, uh, Lithgow plays him to a T in the movie The Civil Action, but Judge Walter J. Skinner, who was definitely pro-government, said, well, Mr. Barely, if what you have to say is true, you have nothing to worry about if I let Marshallton on the site for 30 days, and if Marshallton's successful, you haven't been diligent. So the court in its wisdom let Marshallton on site for 30 days. We had a U.S. Marshal on board uh, to uh, assure us that uh, 
that uh, nothing was going to be recovered. And sure enough, they didn't find that they didn't find the gold. They didn't even look in the proper part. But the one thing they did recover, which was was to, an interesting fact, they did recover the purse's office safe from the purse's office, right. which was right on which was right on the upper deck, exactly where it should have been. And what that told me, and what should tell anyone, is that if there was any prior salver on the wreck, the first thing they would have recovered is a low hanging fruit, which would have been the purse's safe. Right. The fact that the purse's safe was still in place indicates the wreck was not worked. In addition, we've done a recent scan. We've scanned the wreck in several times. We did a recent scan of the wreck in July 2017, which is in one of our press releases, which shows a clear detail of the wreck as she sits as of July. And the and our research report on where the gold would be located within the wreck uh, puts it in a part of the wreck that was clearly unexplored, unexcavated, remains intact, as I found the wreck in, in 1981. And the reason why it was not salvaged is because it would, if you look at all the classic salvages, the Edinburgh, the Niagara, the Egypt, all the classic salvages were contract salvages. They were, they were salvages, not really treasure hunts, but salvages that were contracted by the original owners, whether it be the British government, primarily the British government, to recover their gold cargoes. Even the HMS Edinburgh was a contract salvage. The problem with the Republic was there was no government to contract with. No one's going to give the Bolsheviks a right to the gold on the Republic for bonds that they had repudiated. And that issue remained unresolved until 1933. And again, uh, there was no technology to recover the wreck at that depth. So so there was no there was a reported salvage attempt in 1919. And the reason why I find that interesting, because in 1919, you still have the civil war ongoing in Russia. Who would have known about the gold on the Republic? The white Russians. The white Russians would have wanted to recover their gold to use for counter-revolutionary purposes, but it was simply until until the 1950s and 1960s beyond recoverable depth. Okay. So, Steve, and I like the skeptic. Come on, let's, so, fight, let's fight this out. Ask me. Ask me the I'll tough questions. Back. So, right. So you firmly believe the gold is still there? <laughs> I don't firmly and, believe it. I know the Navy cargo is there. And okay. I, I highly believe the Russian cargo is there based on the information okay. that we have. And that's $25 million. Now, in, in watching the show, I I see that you guys are diving at 270 feet. And that is probably the biggest hurdle you have in in getting in there and, and even researching, like trying to get into the ship were obstacles in the way. And, and I know one of the divers almost ran out of air. Um, I mean, that had to be just, has to be your biggest hurdle in your, in your operation. Okay. Let's get back to billion dollar wreck, billion dollar wreck. And I'll, I'll call it what it was. It was a dog and pony show. Uh, we went out, uh, history channel offered me a show. I said, all right, we're going to get wide exposure on this. And they did a decent job on the history. They were planning 21 surface dives, of which they only made seven. Each surface dive was about 40 minutes long, seven times 40, 280 minutes, uh, three and a half hours roughly of, of viewing the wreck. Our audience wanted to see the wreck. All we had was surface to, uh, supply diving capability. The way to do this and the way we're planning for our 2022 recovery is saturation diving. Saturation diving, you have divers who are in saturation, it's a different technology, who are working out at depth, who are going to spend two divers at the bell, six hours each. One diving bell run will acquire uh, what, six, eight times as much underwater footage as our entire season, a billion dollar wreck. Our audience wanted underwater footage. Uh, we didn't have the tools to do any excavation. Right, we, didn't have a, right. we, didn't have a, we didn't have a crowbar. We didn't even right. have a crowbar on the show. Okay. We didn't, we didn't have an anchor winch. Uh, if you look at how the men were handling handling the lines, they were nylon lines that they were hand, manhandling. They right, and they could have got stuck. That's the thing. They could have got yeah. trapped in there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a craftsman's only as good as his tools. And when we have to move or remove several thousand tons of debris, right. you know, to get to the gold chamber, uh, so you didn't going... have the tools and capability to do it. But I thought for purposes of exposure... It gave us worldwide exposure. It was added in 90 right. countries, uh, seen by tens of millions of people, uh, that that would get us the interest. And ultimately, it is getting us the interest. It, it provided, and I hate to say this, when they didn't have enough footage, 
uh, on the underwater show. Of course, that's what the audience wanted to see. The audience didn't get what they wanted to see, and that's why primarily they canceled the show. We didn't give them what the audience wanted. Now we're able to give the audience more than what they want because one so, bell run is going to give them 10 times the underwater footage right. as when the entire say, million dollar wreck. When you say bell, you're gonna what you're going to do is you're going to drop a, a pressurized bell yeah, saturation yeah. diving, divers live in a habitat that's pressurized right. to the working depth. Right. See, with yeah, surface supply better. diving, every dive they make, they accumulate nitrogen uh, or yeah. other inert gas, and if they come up to the surface right away, uh, they can suffer what they call decompression sickness. Right. So there's a, lengthy, why. there's a lengthy decompression procedure that has mm -hmm. to be done after every dive. Now, with saturation diving, the divers are living at depth. So although right. the decompression is extensive at the end of the work period, it could be several days of decompression. It's all done in a, hab in a habitat in a decompression right. chamber on the boat. So divers can work on an unlimited amount. Divers will have six to eight hour shifts on the wreck, physically on the wreck. They will right. then commute via the pressurized bell to the pressurized habitat, which is on our, on our diving support vessel. And we're going to have a 12-man sat system, right. saturation diving system. We're going to have a 1,400-ton crane. We're going to have a a a, a, a was it 500-ton grab, uh, like a giant Pac-Man that stands almost 20 feet tall. You know, okay. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna dig into this wreck and tear it. And if you look at our recent press release, we know exactly where we're going based on our historical research. Unlike our 87 effort, where uh, we didn't know where we we're going, that's why we we're unsuccessful then. Uh, but now well, you've, you've come a long way. You've come a long way from then to today. Um, while I was watching the show and watching your divers go down, I mean, boom, they got to the bottom. They had a 30 minute clock. I'm like, like, this is really stressful. And I, I'll bet it was dangerous on those divers. Yes. Surface supply diving is much more dangerous than saturation. diving. In fact, our contractor really didn't even want to do it because they knew it was not the proper tool for the job that we had at hand. Everyone knew that we didn't have the proper tools, but I think I was the yeah. exposure. If History Channel is ready ready to run a series, you know we'll get international exposure. That will get us the investment capital. That will generate the public interest, and and in a sense, it did. You know, so we're 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 now moving forward on getting the right tools, uh, doing the job the way it should be done, with more information both on the cargos and where the specific locations of the wreck are. Or one of our target areas is a second class baggage room. And then the speed, which incidentally, the second class baggage room will be where the Russian gold is held. And the reason why that is because $25 million face value 1909 would be too much gold for the specie room. Uh, it's the same amount of gold that the eight, the RMS Laurenti carried when she sank, except hers was in bars, ours is in, in uh, gold coin, much more preferable. And the bar volume would be still the same. That's why the Laurentix gold was in her second class baggage room. Second class baggage room was also higher up. Uh, the loan didn't close until January 22nd. So the Russian gold wouldn't move until they were satisfied that the loan was a success in Europe on the 22nd. That's six hours later. It's enough time to move the gold from the sub treasury to the ship. Uh, the Navy payroll was available for loading on the 18th. That money is going to be in the specie room, which is lower down in the same section of the ship. So we're going to hit the Russian gold first, then we're going to hit the we're going to hit the Navy payroll uh, later on later on in the in the search. Cap, I got okay. I got a question for you. So, this, this, being that this ship tracking, and obviously this ship is going to sustain sustain some type of damage when it hits the bottom. When you guys go down there, are you physically have to do some dismantling of the ship to get inside there? I mean, you're going to have to do some cutting. I mean, it's not like. And, and no, we're going to do it. It's, it's, swim down and get it right. We're going to do it's an it's a it's an excavation and. and the, the example I used to use was the federal Oklahoma City bombing, the federal Merrill building. Uh, now um, we have the much more uh, recent disaster talking about debris excavation of the Surfside building collapse, which incidentally just happened a few blocks from where I live. Uh, a terrible tragedy, but it's a good example of what is needed to move several thousand tons of debris. Right. There they had 225 men working around the clock, 24-7, uh, multiple grains, uh, all the equipment they need at the surface, uh, and it took them a month to excavate that site. Now, take the same amount of debris. Of course, we're going to have a bigger crane. We're going to have a bigger grab. We're not concerned about, uh, you know, uh, damaging bodies right. uh, or, you know, risking lives by people who might still be alive so we can excavate more aggressively. But we're removing effectively the same amount of debris 
uh, and generally. And then, of course, we don't know how the gold coins will be found. Will they be concentrated? We hope. But most likely they're going to be spread out under, under again, several more thousand tons of debris. So we hope to hit the, the, the honey spot uh, within, well, actually within a week to 10 days. But it may take several years because our season is basically June through August. Right. It may take several, several years of recovery to get all the gold out. Of course, those are problems that we want to have, you know. Yeah, uh, that we have so much gold, it's going to take us several damn, years. Damn, we got to go back and get more gold. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, that's got to suck. Now, <laughs> on on the show Billion Dollar Wreck, your son Grant played an integral role in, as your backup or, or, or in the recovery or, or in the operation. Is he going to have a role in the future as well? Is he? Oh yes, he, he he's he's intimately involved in raising the money. He's He's now the company's lawyer. Uh, when I told him to go to law school, I said, Daddy needs attorney-client privilege, so <laughs> we'll send you to law school. <laughs> and, uh, and you, you, one thing, let, let me say one thing. I, I, one thing. It's taking me longer to recover this gold than it took Moses to find the promised land. Does he make you pay a retainer <laughs> fee? Does, does he make you pay a retainer fee for his... Uh, Services. Hope, no, I mean he 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 knows the sequence of events. Hopefully, like yeah. Moses, unlike Moses, I'll be able to see the promised land. Moses died before he got to get into the promised land. Uh, but it's it's a so, lifelong pursuit. Of course, it's generational money. Uh, you know, we hope to send. I I have some Harvard people involved in this too. We hope to send my grandkids all to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Um. So who else is? In your future plans on this dive that's incorporated, I know you had a uh, archaeologist last time. Tell me, tell me some of the players of your upcoming. Uh, well, Bob, Bob Sombrola, who, who ran the Naval Historical Center in Newport, Rhode Island, will be our, our primary archaeologist. Uh, Bob Evans, who is involved in the Central America, is going to be our primary gold guy, a, a gold nice. coin guy, along with Dwight Manley, who ended up buying the Central America cargo. Uh, so we have uh, we have the premier gold gold expert people in the world. We have uh, you know premier archaeologists uh, and our 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 uh, operations manager is, is Bass Copes, who ran uh, several major uh, salvage operations in the, in the uh, in the U.S. and South America. So we're only going for top quality people, top quality equipment. I'm not going to make the same mistake. Uh, this time uh, that we did in 87. In 87, we didn't know where we were going. I, we thought, excuse me, we thought we knew where we were going, but we didn't know. Now we know. Uh, of course, the plans are not accessible to the Republic, which is which is to be expected. But our, if you read our research, there's a link to uh, the location on the ship where the gold cargo would be. Right, we saw that, yeah. It's a 50-page report, and it's quite extensive, and it, it's well backed by all the research that we've done. Uh, so we know exactly where we're going. We have the scan of the area. It still remains unexcavated and unexplored. That area of the ship probably collapsed soon after the collision. Remember, she sank in January. No one right. could really start operations until until uh, the summer season, June. By that time, the decks had certainly collapsed. Right. And it's very similar, the, the historic viewpoint, very similar to the RMS Laurentic salvage. She's about the same size, built at Harland and Wolf. She was built for Dominion Line uh, and transferred to White Star Line. So all the similarities are there. The gold was in the second class baggage room. Uh, we know exactly where that is on Republic now. Uh, you know, yeah, and the, the ship went down. The ship went down on January twenty fourth, in nineteen oh nine. So there's coming up another anniversary in four days. So when do you plan on diving next? When is when is all this going to come together and take place? You say June is the time when you could start. Is it going to be this June, or do you need another year or more? No, it, or it's June, June, 2022. We're okay. going to be on site. Our plan is to be on site June 1st, 2022. So we have the entire season to work. Uh, once we hit the gold, uh, we'll bring in, our plan is now uh, at this point to bring in a diving support vessel. Uh, originally, we're going to do a, a barge, an excavation barge to do the major excavation. We anticipate hitting the gold in about 10 days to two weeks. And then we bring the diving support vessel in with the divers to remove the gold uh, integrally. Of course, what we're doing now, and one of the reasons I'm on the show, we're, we're in, I'll get another plug in. We're in money raising mode right. now, and we can That's we can true. actually we can actually promote that uh, due to new recent SEC changes. 
uh, for what they call accredited investors. We have a 506 uh, regulation D 506 C offering uh, for accredited investors. That's generally someone who whose net worth is a million dollars or makes makes excluding your home and makes over two hundred thousand dollars a year. We also have a crowd. We also have for everyone else. We have a crowdfunding offering on WeFunder, W-E-F-U-N-D-E-R dot com. If you do a search for treasure or Lords of Fortune, you find our offering there. We take investments for as little as $100, $100 uh, up to any amount. It pays differently. Uh, the WeFunder offering, well, I, I really can't go into details. You have to look at both offerings respectively. Right. So go check out the WeFunder site. Uh uh, for Lords of Fortune, Lords of Fortune, uh, or simply search for treasure on their site and our, our offering will come up. Or go to our lordsoffortune.com website if you are an accredited investor and there the minimum investment is $25,000, but it pays more actually in the long run. That's so, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is, this, this is the time when I want to talk about your websites. I want you to plug whatever you've got. Um, are we going to have a show in the future? Is Is there plans for another show well we have actually i'm talking that i'm talking to one group that wants to put a feature film together uh from the uk uh and uh we will be filming our own you know uh, we'll be using many uh, some of the same crew that we use for billion dollar rec because i made friends okay. there uh and we'll be filming we haven't struck a deal with a media outlet we may uh subsequently strike that deal or self-syndicate uh for the release but yes everyone will be able to see it of course the term I use now, the term billion dollar wreck is too low. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm looking forward to the show coming back. I mean, I was really left with a cliffhanger at the end of that. And, and, you know, I still believe your work was not even, had not even began with that show. And, and after talking to you, I firmly believe it when it comes to, like you said, the equipment. So I feel that, you know, from, what I understand is your funding is a lot in place right now and your equipment's going to be done a lot better. And I feel that do you, and I know you're going to say you have a great plan and you feel you're going to be, you have a better chance of success now than you really did before is what you're saying. That's, that's exactly right. We have more information now. We have more information regarding the construction of the vessel. We have more information regarding the location of the cargoes within the vessel. Uh, and uh, and we prove of the Navy cargo and the information we have with the Russian cargo. I believe the Russian cargo is there with, with the information I have, but it's still, you know, one might say it's cir purely circumstantial. But then again, on, if we're a criminal case, we can get a, a conviction on circumstantial evidence. Right. But you got to get there. You got to get it. I mean, that was the whole thing. You need the tools, the expertise, the, the equipment and personnel to get like you're not just walking through a door. I mean, that's exactly gonna, right. Right. You've got a lot of work ahead of you at under 270 feet of water. It's going to be, please don't mind my aunt walking behind me. I mean, we're That's just trying right. to do it's, a show here. I love it. It's, it's, it makes it a, a real homegrown story. Oh, it's hungry. <laughs> when I start yelling, you're going to see. So it seems like you got your work cut out for you. And hopefully everything is organized enough that it's going to, I mean, I wish you success. I hope it's going to pay off. I mean, you know, but the I whole thing, two, 270 feet underwater is just in, incredible to me how these guys are working. Well, it's, it's, but in a sense, that's a good thing, too, because the reason why the gold still remains there is that, one, there was no owner to contract with, uh, and two, because of the technical difficulties, you know. Well, it wasn't uh, easy to get to. <laughs> that's right. Well, no, the, the, this, this is what I always say. The, the reason why the gold is, the, all right, let's. The difficulty in making this project a success, it was not finding the wreck. It took me two and a half days to find it. And it will not be working the wreck because the technology is there to do it now. Uh, the, mo the difficulty was proving the cargoes. Because if you look at all the original, uh, the original stories, there was never any, any firmness in why there was money on board. And that's what people, uh, and there's a reason for that. The government kept that information away from the public. Because uh, because of the governmental interest in the cargos, and now that we've defeated the government because they, we litigated them with a year, we now own the wreck, we own the cargos. All future claims are barred. 
So we are in the strongest legal position possible. We are owners of our own property and we are not, we're no longer in salvage mode. Salvage is when you do recovery for third party. We are in recovery mode because we're recovering our own property. Yeah. Exactly. But you have to, you now, you're, you now have to get into the ship. Your you first thing, let's get into that ship and show that it's there. Yeah. Go in there, get me a picture of what's there and then getting it out is not going to be tough because I'm sure if you have proof that there's gold in there, people are going to throw money at you to get that out. Exactly. And that's why, that's why, that's why once we see the gold, you know, we have it, we have a $12.5 million budget, which includes two prongs. It includes uh, excavation, $5 million roughly, and then the balance is recovery. We may need more money for recovery, but all we need really is a $5 million and we're up, we're pretty close to reaching that right now. Because once, as you say, once we see the goal, we can borrow at a commercial loan rates. You're, exactly. We're, yeah. we're, we're, the term would be we're golden because we have a ship of gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and you oh, believe oh, what, what, that brings Bob Evans and the Central America into this. If you read the uh -huh. book uh, Ship of Gold, since I did mention it, uh, and you look at the section in, in Ship of Gold, very good book on the Central America salvage, where Tommy Thompson and Bob Evans is talking about selection of targets. They mentioned the Republic and they, and they mentioned Republic specifically in ship of gold. And they say, they mentioned it as a white star passenger liner off Nantucket, right. which is Republic. And they say, well, we didn't select that target because there, there was rumors that it was large amounts of money on board, but no one really knew. Well, now we know, and we know why it sat, why it's there. We've found repayments of the short term loan. We found government uh, cover story for $25 million ship. And we have a witness, the, gr the granddaughter of uh, Republic's radio operator, saying there's $25 now, million on board. Is this going to be a harder recovery than the uh, Central America? No. Uh, yes and no. Central America had to deal with depth. But the advantage there, she was a wooden wreck. And, of course, wooden wrecks right. decompose. They decompose, right. and what did they, they find? They just picked it off the bottom. They, they went up there and they picked it, it off the bottom. Exactly. You can't do that, though. You're in there. You're you're in a in metal cages, where that's going to cut stuff and and getting in there. But yeah. once you get in there, well, once you let's say let's say you let's say textbook, you open this ship up. There's tons and tons of gold. How are you going to get it to the surface with a crane? Well, it depends on how the gold is concentrated. You know whether it's concentrated, where it's spread out, whether the boxes it should be a, it should be 625 160 pound boxes, each containing forty thousand dollars face value in double eagle gold coins. Nice little haul, forty five tons on all. So it depends on one. how the <laughs> everybody, everybody, everybody in the chat wants one. They all, they all want <laughs> one. Box. I'm not greedy. Yeah, I, oh. I'm gonna get, now you want one box? Okay, people want one. Coin. <laughs> Just. Just, just as an aside, we as part and I as part of the the part of the crowdfunding offering, uh, crowdfunding offering, uh, we're going to offer out of anyone who puts in at least a hundred dollars, which participates in the crowdfunding offer, we're going we're to have a drawing for three people who can spend some time on the boat while we do the recovery. Nice. That's awesome. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, okay. Let's but but any event, yeah. Any event, how are we going to recover? It depends on how how the coins are found. If they're all concentrated, if the boxes are relatively intact, which is a possibility. Uh, we can potentially bring them up by box by box. Some boxes are going to be open, in which case we have to bring them up coin by coin. Uh, but, but if, if, concentrate, if the if the if the if the second class baggage room is relatively intact, we might consider even cutting the whole section of the ship out and bringing the whole section of the ship up, which we can do by uh, strapping it. The problem with it is we anticipate that the wreck is in such degraded uh, condition that it will simply break up before we bring it to the surface. Can you use, we're going to look at it as an option. Balloons? Can you use lift balloons at that depth? Do we use what? The lift bags. Yeah, well, lift bags. Some lift bags will be be used for some of the work, but most likely it's going to be a, a crane with a basket. Uh, divers will put stuff in the basket and we'll bring it up basket and, by and basket. Pull it up that way. Yeah. Okay. Here's my here's my question. Okay, you're sitting on the boat next summer, June of 2022. You're sitting there on a boat. Diver comes up to the surface. He's holding a double eagle. We'll see. First, it. We'll see it on first, the scans before he brings it up. <laughs> first recovered coin to touch the surface. First recovered coin to touch the surface gets put into your hand. Absolutely. What gonna, what's going to happen to that first coin that comes out of there? Oh, that's going to be that's going to be uh, a generational item. 
uh, to, so hopefully my great, great grandchildren will say, ah, oh, that was great, great grandpappy's first coin. The first one is, yep, you're getting the first one and you're probably going to put it around your neck. Huh? That's right. And when they, when they, when I look at our, when I look at the portrait of great, great grandpappy in the two story tall dining room in the portrait with his nice young wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Who's going to uh, take all the money? Just one, just one, just one. <laughs> You're only gonna have just one. Well, so we'll listen. see. All right, because you know, you put me in that situation. I'll buy my own country. So I can have a <laughs> yeah, place. exactly. Yeah, buy my own country. So and we got. Um, I'm, I'm sure we have women in the audience, so we have to be careful about what we say here. So we can yell that all the time by them. They I got one standing. I got one standing right behind me, and I don't care. <laughs> so. I, I'd like to welcome you to the Detect America family, and I'd like to say one thing. Uh, our page is your page, so feel free to come on there and post links to how people can come to your page, uh, post a link to your book, okay, whatever you feel, because I think we got a lot of people now interested in this story, and I, for one, know that come June of 2022, I'm going to want to know where this operation is in in progress uh because i'm really i'm hooked man i like this i i like i said i wish you nothing but the greatest success any, and I, any I hope network that doesn't pick up this dive oh. and i'm gonna say straight up whether it was successful or not any network that doesn't find this story amazing and isn't there with cameras rolling is an idiot right and and you better. I, I don't, thank God I don't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you better you better choose your networks early off in this thing too, because you know everyone's going to come pounding on your door with low ball offers for this once you once you do score. So that's the whole thing. Who's on your side before you you find it? That's well, going to be the kid. That's the, that's the trick. Actually, that's a trick with women too. You know, exactly. I, I have plenty of women after the gold. You know, oh, <laughs> I want the one that, that's going to struggle with me to get it. You know, so <laughs> all right, now they're going to be knocking on my door. <laughs> now, I, I do have a quick question. I do have a quick question. Now, let's say you start to recover coins and artifacts. Who and how will you um uh? What am, I, what am I thinking, Frank? What, who's going to um, clean those artifacts and and, wow. and take care of those? <laughs> well, I said we have we have we have the, one of the world's uh, renowned coin experts, uh, Bob Evans, who did the conservation work on the Central right. America cargo. Uh, we have we have Dwight Manley, who who is the marketer for the Central America cargo, who's, who's going to most likely uh, be our marketer for our cargos. Now we have this is the problem. And, of course, this is a problem we want to have. The Navy cargo, we anticipate, since it's $800,000 face value, 1909, and mixed coins, it's going to be everything from pennies, nickels, dimes, to double eagles. Right. Uh, that money we can promote, uh, and it won't adversely affect the market. In fact, we, we anticipate selling, for example, a 1907 penny, as an example, that normally has a numismatic value of $7 for maybe $29.95 with a letter Gorgeous. of authenticity. And as a large market who can afford a twenty nine ninety five penny, now a right. double eagle, let's say a, 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 an 1885 double eagle that may have a uh, average price of $15,000 and a mint state condition $150,000, it will have a premium on it, but it's not going to have that type of premium. And in addition, since we have 25 million, 45 tons, the last thing we want to do is, is flood the market. We don't want to convert gold to fiat currency particularly when we're dealing with potential inflation. Gold is king. So we're going to try to hold on to that as long as possible, leverage it. We have several business uh, concepts that we'll be developing, uh, you know, and uh, and that's well, all, all in discussions with our, with our, uh, with our investors, our credit Ron, investors. Ron says he doesn't care how much it costs. He wants to buy me one. <laughs> Ron doesn't care how much it's going to cost. He wants to buy his I, friend a double. Boy, Steve, a double. Yeah, he like, wants to buy that for me. Steve, uh, I got. I got so, to say one. I got to say one thing. I know I've been sitting here and I've been quiet, but I, 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 I can't fathom the research. How you found all that information out? How you found how the Russians, the loans? It amazes me. That 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 is a that is a show in itself. That's. That's that that that's what I consider my you know, I always say this, it was never the money. 
you know, it was always the mystery. And that's what intrigued me. I, you know, uh, oh, here's a little side story. Ever, has everyone seen the, uh, the movie, The Big Short? The Big Short about the real estate collapse? Uh, and there was a doctor in that, a main character in that story, uh, who had a hedge fund who recognized what was going to happen. And he created this hedge fund because he was able to foresee things in the market that other people couldn't foresee. And he attributed that. My son Grant read the book and then he, I, you know, he told me about it. He attributed that because he had lost an eye. And he said, with one eye, there's a concept called uh, uh, neuroplasticity, where the eye that is lost, uh, the part of the brain that takes input from that eye is lying idle. So it applies itself rather than lie idle to other issues. So that could be one reason why I was able to assemble all of these facts because I was able to see what was happening that, that other people, including professional researchers, couldn't see. And that's why I make the research available for critical examination. Uh, we did that only once we owned began ownership of the wreck. Of course, I'm not going to release it until we own the wreck and until all future claims are barred. And we also have uh, and will have, again, injunctive relief against the world from any interference with our recovery. So yeah. we're, we're well protected. But that, that's one, one explanation. In, in high school, one of my best classes was geometry. Uh, and in geometry, uh, you're given rules and theorems and you have to solve a problem. Uh, and I started you know, raising my hand all the time. Eventually, uh, the geometry teacher didn't call on me anymore because I was dominating the class because I was able to work out all the problems. But when someone, uh, when they had a particularly difficult problem when the teacher couldn't figure out the problem himself that they'd, they'd ask they say martin what's the answer and i tell them the answer it's just the way my mind works and that could be the explanation as to why i was able to assemble these facts where others others couldn't because of the loss of one eye uh it's 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 uh huh? I, don't, I don't recommend that to anyone <laughs> but but it is, no, yeah, it, it is right when one door closes another right. opens right so just so Hey, man, you can it is, yeah. Time. You must have spent hours upon hours upon hours of research, more or less, correct? Oh, I mean, I, I mean, this is a life's work, literally. And not even in the U.S. I understand you went. We went to Paris. We went to London. Right. Uh, Paris and London. Paris for the Paris banks, where we got the internal loan documents that, that showed that Russia wasn't paid a nickel for 30 days. That confirmed our 30-day short-term loan. We found documents where where out of the proceeds, this, the money was issued to the state bank. Uh, so the state bank could replay the, thir the uh, $3 million. Uh, so uh, that's a 30-day short-term loan, which is in my book. You know, the $25 million is, 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 is it's a fascinating, fascinating discussion. It said the research what? is available. What have you already done with the artifacts that have been recovered? I know you recovered plates and and what what have you recovered and what are you doing with it already? Well, the, well everything's in conservation at this point. We're not going to do anything with with any of the artifacts until we've concluded our, our recovery because they all go into the investor investor pool. Okay. So. Can you tell us some of the things besides the plates? Was there was there anything that wasn't on the show that you recovered that we don't know? Oh about? yeah, in eighty seven we rec we recovered. I have the the ships. I have the ships. I don't know if I can. I can. No, I can't get to it from here. But at the ship's wheel, the aft aft helm, sitting in my dining room, uh, okay. it's marked A three forty five. Uh, three forty five was was uh, Harlan and Wolf's yard number. Uh, an interesting story in that, and I think they picked it up on the show. <clears throat> One of the places I went to for research was Vineland. Oh, you guys in Vineland? Yeah. So yeah. In Vineland. Yeah, we are. Frank was right in I'm Vineland. In Vineland. Well, Captain, there we go. You're going to like this. Captain Sealby was president of the Vineland Historical Society. Right. In fact, he lived in Vineland. So you guys have a, actually a very good connection. So one of the sources I went to. Well, he is he, uh, he's not, he wasn't involved with the, the Andrea Doria, was he? No, but the captain of the Florida, which collided with Republic, was involved with the Andrea Doria. In fact, he, he suggested that the Andrea Doria be built at, a, I think it was a, uh, uh, at a Scandinavian yard. So there's we have, actually we have one, of the, one of the divers, one of the, one of the guys who was involved with finding the Andrea Doria is literally is around the corner from me. Right. Well, Peter, Peter Gimble, I mean, uh, was one of the first divers on that when soon a few days or it was a week or so after she sank. So the, everyone yeah, knew where the Doria later, was. Right. This was much right. later. But yeah. Sealby was. Bell, that's how I know. <laughs> but Sealby was in Vineland and he was the captain of what ship? Republic. The Republic. All right, she was the captain of Republic, right. And, and he became 
he became president of the Violent Historical Society. Right. So I contacted them and they said he had they have all his personal papers. So I said, wait a minute, personal papers of the captain of the republic. And we knew uh, that he always wanted to defend himself. He never had the opportunity at a public hearing to defend himself and his actions. Why? Because in a public inquiry, they would have had to disclose the manifests. They would have had to put people under under uh, testimony, under oath, in a public forum. And they couldn't permit that to happen because any leak of the loss of this much Russian gold yep. would have caused the collapse of the Russian government, you know, rather than 1917, shortly after 1909. Now I got a project, Cap. Now I got a project because one of my good friends is the president of the Historical Society now. Yeah, well, I was there. In fact, a little backstory on that. Uh, I went to Vineland and I and I uh, and I re rented a room. At, I think it was a Holiday Inn. And the guy at the, the counter at the desk says, "Well, you want smoking or non-smoking?" So I said, "I'll take non-smoking." So he gives me the room key to room three forty-five. Three forty-five is Republic's whole number. So <laughs> I, said, yeah, I said, "Whoa, you know." Uh, I didn't ask for room 345. He just gave me a non-smoking room, room 345. <laughs> now, of course, I knew CLB was buried in, in Vineland, and I, I went to a number of cemeteries there, and I, I started out at the Catholic cemetery. And you, once you start walking around cemeteries, you learn a lot about how they operate. And of course, they plant people in sequence. They don't just randomly plant them around all over the place. They develop a part of the cemetery over a period of time, and then they close that and open up another part of the cemetery. So I was, I was, I, I practically, I was there looking through various cemeteries, you know, two or three days, and I came to Siloam Cemetery. I was just going to say, you probably in Siloam. Yeah, and 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 I, I practically given up. It was getting towards the end of the day, uh, and I sighted my car over the cemetery, and the most direct route to get to my car was to was to take the direct route. So I started talking, walking to my car, and I see a crucifix, big uh, granite crucifix, it says Seal B. This is on my way walking as I'm ready to leave. I'm about to give up. And there, there's a big, there's a, there's a CLB cemetery. And of course, I look down and there's Inman. There he is. His, his brother is Joseph there. Joseph's wife, Caroline, is there. And there's an empty plot next to CLB, which is sad because CLB never, never, mar never married. I guess that, that was supposed to be for CLB's, just, CLB's wife. Just, so, a little, just a little fact that I came probably as close to anyone on the planet to looking him face to face because I, I, uh, I ran radar on every grave in that cemetery, re replotting that cemetery. So I ran radar over his grave. Oh, really? <laughs> so I looked. So I looked at what his casket, pretty much. You probably fried his body with your radar. <laughs> but, but in any event, when I when, when we went to when we went to the Vinland Historical Society, they had they had personal records. They had letters from passengers thanking them for saving their lives. But there was not a stitch. On the on anything regarding cargo, on anything regarding the collision itself, on any plans, nothing whatsoever regarding the details of the collision. You would think that would have been information he would have collected for his defense, and it wasn't there. And the reason why it wasn't there it was all destroyed. I'm sure you know they were instructed. They, there was an inquiry in Britain. We know this. The entire crew was brought over to Britain after the collision. They were over there for a month. I found a letter at the Violent Historical Society from a love interest. Uh, who was a feminist at the time? We did a little background search. Uh, he referred to her, her, or she referred to herself as the red rubber ball, which I, which I found very interesting. Uh, but in, in any event, uh, she says, "What is the board of trade doing to you right now? You know, we, your friends want to know. You know, when they don't hear from you, they get worried. But that's what happened. They had a board of trade inquiry. It was, and I was sure they were all instructed in the Official Secrets Act not to say anything." Because the disclosure of the loss of this much cargo would have caused the collapse of a friendly regime yeah. and, and a world financial panic. That's how much gold was on there. So uh, that's that's the reason for the secrecy. That's the reason she's not on any chart. That's the reason why she's not on any anti-submarine chart. That's the reason there's no plans uh, recoverable. Uh, and, of course, I say this out front. You know, I say, yeah, there's U.S. government gold. There's a U.S. Navy payroll on board. The U.S. government sued us. If what I had to say wasn't true, I wouldn't be able to say it. No, I'll tell you what, I think it's incredible. And we wish you a lot of luck. I want to thank you for coming on. 
Um, I would like you to, if it's possible, I know you're a busy person, but in our chat was a lot of questions. If you decide you want to come back to our page and maybe answer some of those questions for the folks, because I just couldn't sit here and read the chat and convey any questions they might have. The chat was going a mile a minute. Oh, it, it was, yeah. And, and and that's, you know. Well, let's do that. Schedule me for, for a follow-up, because I, I thrive on questions. People have questions I want to answer mm -hmm. them, and I have the I have the answers. And if I don't know, I, I'll admit I don't know. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to you. Okay, we, great. We, oh, you guys are gonna are, are recording this. I take it. You're gonna put it on YouTube. It's it's it, actually no. it's actually in archived on our page. Our, our page is ten thousand members. It's on our page, and right. then uh, it, it's possible I can download it and put it to the YouTube as well. Yeah, it would be nice if you put it to YouTube, and you you get more you get more subscribers too. And I, I probably added to your numbers somewhat. I'm sure you did. Right. And I and and you're a member of Detect America now, and you're part of the family. And well, like you. I said, thank please you, use please use our page to keep me and everyone else updated in this venture, because super amazing story. Absolutely. And we're all I'm I'm wishing nothing but success on this because I'd love to see. Oh yeah, I'd we're we're, nothing, we're following it now, big time. <laughs> I would love nothing but to see you succeed and and just crush it out well it, this will be i mean uh, this will be this will be the largest uh, tre treasure shipwreck recovery in history if if what i have to say is true and if we find the gold so that would be awesome Absolutely. uh feel free to post any links to shows books upcoming events and investment i, I didn't want to tell you this but but um him he 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 don't point at me <laughs> he's, he's the investor bucks. type <laughs> ronnie big bucks and listen i got his credit card number if you need <laughs> okay, and i know what his limit is and, and he he can mr big bucks over there can yeah he's he's good for it i heard he so, wants to buy me a coin off that ship so um, Ronnie, so everybody a coin. Why not? <laughs> i get yeah well ronnie, we, will we, pay, we, we have plans to pay out primarily in kind uh, for tax reasons, because if we pay out in kind on the investment, there's no profit uh, for you to report until you sell something and generate a profit. Right, right, beautiful. Ronnie, would you like to say good night to our guest? I, I gotta, I gotta say, I could sit here and listen to you. Oh yeah, days. And uh, yeah. you know, if you ever come up with something you might have forgot to mention, yeah, there's a lot. Keep we'll in definitely touch reach with out us. again. I'd love to have you back on. It was fascinating. Yeah. This is the kind of stuff that I thrive for. This well, thank you, thank you. Hunting. It was it was fun it's being like here. Live... I enjoyed it. You see me smile a lot, you know. So <laughs> it's like uh... a live history. It's like a live history. You know, yeah, we're talking exactly. history hey, with. We, we brought you know the History Channel to yeah. our show tonight. That's what yeah. we did. And this is why I say we're 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 a metal detecting community, but. Other topics bounce off of metal detecting. There's so many oh, people I know that. that are interested in this. I have a large and, following. Yeah, metal yeah. detectors. Yeah, so, detectionists. I'd like to thank you for being here, Frank. Would you like to say good night? Yeah, absolutely. We couldn't have asked for a better guest tonight. I appreciate you coming on so much and and spending so much time with us. Fascinating stuff. And now I'm I'm going to go back to my haunts at the old cemetery and and, and find the captain <laughs> of the republic. Tonight. Yeah, I want to see. I got, I got, I, I got. If you look at our website, rms-republic.com, there's a gallery there, and I have pictures of the grave and all that. There. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, yeah. nice, nice. So please post all your links when you get a chance on our page. Uh, you need anything? Let me know, and don't forget millions. millions. <laughs> all right, Ron. Big, it's it's on you investor. now. So <laughs> big investor, right? Me, I'm broke. I'm pissed broke. Uh, I got nothing. Okay. That Ronnie wants great. to buy me a coin at whatever cost. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, if it's the second one that comes up, he's buying. Second, you know, third, you, fifth. I'm not picky, man. I'm yeah, we're picky good. All. all right, folks. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Great. Thanks Cap so much, buddy. Captain Steve, Martin Frank, and Ron. It was great meeting you guys, and uh, yeah. and I look forward to future discussions. Absolutely, right, man, buddy. I, we thank, look thank forward to it as well. And have a good night. Take good care. Luck. And and good luck. It is. I mean. Steve, I'm going to make it easy on you because people were asking. I've already generated a wheel. We've got over 100 names on it. I told them you're giving away a walker. I am? Yeah. Oh, out of the thing. So I'm going to I'm going to generate I'm going to I'm going to do a spin. Yeah. 
I got you, man. You just tell me who wins. And we're spinning. And we're spinning. Todd Eoff. Todd Eoff, you got a minute, brother. You got a minute. And, uh, dude, that dude, that dude, the, the research is mind-boggling. Unbelievable. How he just everything. The magnitude, the magnitude of the guest that he is, um, is pretty incredible. And it's nice that they take the time to come on and 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 correlate with us, correspond with us, talk with us, and Daddy hopefully he'll stay in memory. Here, by the way, so congrats, okay. Daddy. I'll PM your information over to Steve Pacifico since uh, he's uh, got the box of coins. And, and congrats, if you miss getting yourself a walker. If you folks missed out on today, we'll we'll hit it. We got time. We'll goof off. If you don't stay on, you don't stay on. You're gonna miss. If you guys did not see the box of coins, one hundred and nine. I don't know how the hell we're gonna give all this away. One hundred and ninety pieces of gifts. When I show you this box, oh my god, we we had it out today. I, I couldn't wait to open it. I I knew I didn't have time tonight because. We had our guest coming on, but when I tell you this is twelve hundred dollars worth of coins right here, folks. Okay, this is all. This box weighs eight pounds. Eight pounds of silver right here. There was oh well, there was some of this in there, so maybe seven pounds. How much do you weigh now, Steve? Like four pounds? I mean, I'm just oh, Jesus, I, <laughs> dude, I I rated this thing for all the good coins. Let me there, tell you, but, some um, valuable coppers in there. So don't worry about Oh my God, silver. we pulled out a large center. Oh, here it is. I had large center. Large center. Oh shit! I just dropped one. Let's see, I do. Oh shit! All right, well, it's well, minus one now. There. At the end of the year, when we need coins, we will just go to your cellar and look in the. Bed. I don't know. It's, it's like it's like Frank's. It's like Frank's. Yeah, like 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 Frank's like truck. But look. This beautiful um, large scent in here. I know you can't see. Look, that's a beauty right there. In there, there's a bunch of them in there. There's everything. This box is loaded. A lot of standing quarters. We got some standing quarters. Lines. Look, another, another, another large. Jesus, right? So we are our season. And listen, Martin Bailey was just our debut of guests for this season. We have been in touch with Sean Pomeranke of Bering Sea Gold. Sean Pomeranke's coming in in November. We're spacing him out a little bit because, listen, we have to have shows where I get to talk. I mean, come on. I know. Sean Steve, Steve couldn't get a word in it. Oh, my God. My God. Don't get me started. Well, Sean so, Pomeranke from Bering Sea Gold. We have um, Daryl Miklos, Miklos is coming just, on. And I got to tell you, this was all Frank. This is all Frank's work. He has he went out and got Martin Bailey, uh, Daryl Miklo, Sean Palmeranke, and who else do, did you get? You got some others. So, well, we we've got, I, I think we got well, Steve Moore from uh, from um, Garrett has got a book out, and, and he's been on some adventures recently. So I'm working out time for Steve Moore. We've Find out what he's been up to. Delek yeah. coming on with Delek. a big announcement very soon. We're going to try and get Robert and April connect again because they're the best. They're yeah, awesome. No, they will be on. I've, I've, reached, I've reached out to Kim Fisher and the Fisher crew. They haven't gotten back to me yet. Uh, our goal our goal is to provide you guys with some of the best guests that we can get. It's And, and we're not just getting Johnny Detectorist next door to come on the show. As you see, Billion Dollar Wreck, great show. Uh, Daryl Miklos from Cooper's Treasures. Bering sea, gold. Bering sea Gold. We had listen, having Chuck Smalley on the show, he's great. And then of it, course, you know, I'll be I'll be in and out filming television shows and stuff. That <laughs> and then we got then we got that. <laughs> that, you know what? Since Captain Bailey already cursed, we gotta listen to Frank shit the whole time too. So I'm trying to get guests on so we don't have to listen to him. And I want to tell you something. <laughs> yeah, I, you know what I just figured out? You know, Mr. Big Time Movie Star, dude. You're not big time till you start dating a Kardashian. Oh. That's all I'm going to say. Once you start rubbing elbows with the Kardashians, it's different. But you I, ain't rubbing I, elbows I with the only, Kardashians. I can only turn her down so many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, I hope that was a good. Great show. Um, Great show. Guest, a good show. We try and turn it up. 
when we're gonna have Greg time... Capallo back on soon. Oh God, yeah, we're gonna the uh, the game Listen, for April FH eight. We got to get Greg on soon too because guess what? FH eight is just around the corner. If you don't start planning now, you're gonna find yourself having a little bit of uh, difficulties. If you know you need a flight or or a room. So we're, we're going to touch on that in the next week or so. we got to do that, Frank. We're going to have our Halloween show coming up probably the last Monday of October. We will be broadcasting Halloween again from the Fonts' living room. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try and pencil that in because I'm, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be away on a shoot that week. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. You never know. These things are so fluid. Uh, you better hope you're invited. <laughs> I got, I got, I got more Halloween got money. Halloween. Yeah, Halloween show. I got new ones coming, new design. So, so we're gonna we're gonna have, we're gonna have the Halloween, Halloween show coming. Bills. We're just here for the guests, man. I'm trying to do. You know, we're trying to do this. Listen, don't forget our sponsor. I I, I don't know why. I don't know. I went through it today, but. We have to drill over and over our sponsor. Let's not forget our fellow broadcasters, Josh Kimmel, great man. Audra Thomas on Tuesday night and Thursday night at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, guys. 8 o'clock starting Thursday. 8 o'clock shows. Uh, Shelly and Dawn with Can You Dig It? And I'm not going to – listen, I was talking to Shelly tonight. I don't think you guys know this, but she had some big news. She's going to be – they're going to be posting some fines from Virginia. Ooh. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. W world history being made here because Shelly found something. Nice. <laughs> Shelly found something. And and I think she was kind of downplaying it a little bit, but dude, when you go, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bur bursting her bubble, man, but th this is a great find. I'm not going to say anything else, but keep an eye out on oh, Shelly's post. Didn't tell me. Uh, <laughs> She wasn't. They weren't telling anybody. I think she kind of slipped with me, and and uh, we're gonna get. We're gonna see the pictures. That, oh wait! That, oh wait! We can't go. We can't go yet. We hold on. So I want to. I, I I promised I was gonna show this. So our buddies, Matt and Joey oh, Kwiatkowski. I love you guys. Then a I package love you guys. today. Oh. Um, now, to me, I got a candy corn candle, which I showed <laughs> earlier. And three three packs of different kinds of candy corn. By you the guys way. really just stroke his ego more than anything. It's bad. Uh, his ego's bad enough as it is. But there was stuff in the box for Steve. He might, ego's he might not on it. But anyway, I want to show. This was a gla beautiful glass Christmas ornament for Steve. Look at that! I love that. Oh, that's going dude, right that's, on my tree. That's pretty awesome. If I don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and keeping with the whole fast food theme. These are candles. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I was disappointed. I was hoping it was real ketchup and mustard. I'm like, yeah. This is my <laughs> candle. Ron, you're too normal. <laughs> oh, and, and by oh, the way yeah. there, Tinkerbell. Hey, Tinkerbell, where's your tiara? What tiara? Oh, I left in the house. Yeah, oh, of course. You have oh, to no, wear I'm that. Wore it. I have look, wore it. I look, princess. I, uh, I, uh, Don Kuhn has sent me a beautiful... Tiara, it was awesome. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Josh Kimmel sent me the the turkey dinner candy corn, and I got a different type of that from uh, Matt and Joni today as well. Let me tell you what the turkey dinner candy corn, folks, is a must have. It's amazing, amazing. I killed the, got, I killed the bag already. <laughs> we have got some of the greatest guests. I mean, uh, members in the world. We really do. We've got the greatest sponsor we really do and then on frank <laughs> yeah so um and anybody listen in all seriousness i got a lot of pms about where i was i i, I would absolutely tell you guys we are not done i have to go back up at the end of october and finish the little gig i was on right. um, i will go into the whole story i will i will go this far not only did i find one of the main things we were looking for I found cool stuff in, in there too. So we, yeah, it, it's a great story. And, um, you can tell only as much as you can tell, but 
Once, it, once we're finished and it's locked down, then we'll tell the whole story. Yeah, it's a shame he can't, but we'll we'll do all that. That'll come out. Yeah, that'll so I'm sure if your ship's dropping off, we, we're running at 940. Yeah. Let's get out of here. We'll come back next Monday with another great show for you guys because we are just better than we've ever been. We better are better than, than ever. Key phrase. Better than we've better ever than been. Ever. We are better than ever. So Ronnie, you want to say your good nights? Good night, everybody. Thanks again. Show was great. That guy yeah. was fantastic. You the man, buddy. Good night, everybody. Good night. And and right there, class act. Absolutely. For him, for him to step up and say he wants to buy the second gold coin off of the RMS Republic for me is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Seriously. Amazing. Know. It's just the nicest thing someone could say. <laughs> and it'll probably be signed by Klinger. <laughs> I'll make I'll make sure it is. <laughs> it's gonna be signed by Klinger. Wait, where's my Maxwell, pen? <laughs> I'm actually Klinger. All right, guys. Listen, I don't know what we got on store for next week, but maybe it'll just be a joke around session. We'll come up with something like we always do because we're listening. We got we got a couple of guests that are in the wings because I can't yeah. lock them down due to their schedule, though. They're gonna pop in pretty much short notice, but buddy, you're uh, doing great with the guests, man. That's I mean, yeah, and, and some like Daryl Miklos, it's tentative because he's uh, yeah, Daryl Dar Miklos is absolutely coming on. Yeah. We have a tentative date for the 11th of October, but yep. he's in Spain doing stuff for his shop and for yep. the project he's got going on. So it, it, we could we could be a week earlier, uh -oh. a week after. And don't forget, we got Doctor Tones coming on. Doctor Tones, Eric Magnuson, mm -hmm. the Dirt Diggler himself from uh, Superstition why Mountains. Why don't you see if you can get Doctor Tones next week? Doctor, he's he's we've been talking back and forth. It's all contingent on his work schedule. He's a fireman. He don't do nothing. <laughs> he gets paid to sleep. What? What does he, what he do? And let's not forget those other two friends of ours, uh, KG and Ringy. They just went to England, man. It might not be bad to get yeah. after they tell their story on their show. Maybe oh, have them pop worry. on. Don't worry. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay a guilt trip on them and tell them we need to have them on around the holidays. Yeah, and I want to see them uh, see what they did in England too. I can't wait to see that. And don't forget FHA. Okay. I'm out of here. Just just get me out. Good night, guys. I'm tired. I got a headache. And it's all uh, because okay. of him. Good My night. headache's because of him. <laughs> My headache right there. Good night, guys. Hit that button. Hit the button. You can't hit it fast. Anyway, I'm yawning. Uh, we want to thank, thank uh, Captain Martin Bailey for being on tonight. The guy is just like his his font runneth over, man. He 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 can talk about that uh, RMS Republic. Uh, we'll be back next Monday night, Tuesday night, Jersey History Hunter with Audra. Wednesday night, Josh Kimmel, Beyond Sight and Sound. Thursday night at 8 o'clock, Shelly and Dawn are moving to 8 o'clock, guys. And then uh, Sunday, Josh again. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Amazing how many people hung with us to the end. Thank you so much. And uh, we will... See you Monday.